In the last video, we talked about the velocity triangles using the airfoil located at uh, the cross section uh, of this uh, vertical blade, uh, as an example. In this video, we will use the entire ring located uh, at the radius r as an example to talk about uh, the blade element momentum method or BEM. Uh, some of the basic geometrical parameters are still identical to those in the last video. Um, for deriving the BEM, we will need we will need to use the cross-sectional area of the entire ring, which is the circumference of the circle multiplying uh, the thickness of the ring, which is dr. So when considering the mass flow through this ring, we can use this expression for the cross-sectional area. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we will still be taking a top-down view from this particular angle and we're going to examine the airfoil uh, located at this particular location so it's still going to be a top-down view looking at this particular cross-section just like in our uh, last video so this is a really complicated figure but don't be intimidated by its appearance we actually have seen some of the vectors and angles in our discussion of the velocity triangles in the last video. So on this um, top-down view, uh, the rotor plane, this plane of blade rotation, uh, is still the horizontal plane. And this particular airfoil uh, is still tilted, right, but the tilt angle is kind of slightly larger than the tilt angle we were drawing in the last video. But that doesn't matter, that doesn't really matter. There are a few things on this figure that we need to examine. So let's look at the velocities first. We've, we've got some velocity vectors. So, so let's look at the, the velocities first. Right. We have the uh, incoming wind. That's the incoming wind velocity, which is actually perpendicular to the rotor plane. Here we have taken into account uh, the axle induction factor A. So the speed as seen, the speed, the length of the vector, the speed of the vector, uh, the, the, the wind, as seen by the rotor plane, is actually slightly less, is actually slightly less than the free stream wind speed U1. Right? So U1 multiply 1 subtract A, A is a positive number, it's uh, smaller than 1, it's uh, smaller than 1 half actually. So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a reduced uh, wind velocity. And in the last video we talked about this reduction caused by this uh, axle induction factor. Uh, next, let's take a look at the, the linear velocity of the airfoil due to the rotation of the blade at uh, the speed of capital omega. And here again, we have taken into account the angular induction factor, A prime. So the linear speed of the blade uh, of the airfoil is actually slightly higher then omega times r, right? Because you have to take into account this angular induction vector. Again, we have talked about this um, slight increase in the angular uh, in the linear velocity because of the angular induction factor in our last video. Right. In the last video, we were using a vector that's actually pointing to the right, right? It's not pointing to the left. This is a difference, right? This is a difference. Um, the reason of this difference is that because in the last video we were actually doing, uh, we we're actually using the rule for vector summation to do vector subtraction. What we really wanted to do is to actually do a vector subtraction, right? But we were using the rules for vector summation. So, so in the last video we have to actually reverse the direction of this horizontal vector, right? Flip it to this direction, right? So we can actually get the negative of this particular vector and then do the summation. And that summation is actually equivalent to subtraction. Right? But in this particular figure here, we're actually doing a vector subtraction. So, so basically, we're actually subtracting this horizontal vector from this vertical vector. Right? It's not a vector summation. Right? Have you noticed? Right? These two vectors are connected uh, head to tail. Right? The head to tail. Right? If it's ve vector summation, then the summation result should go from 
some the, the resulting vector should go from this point, that's the tail, and then go to this point, that's the head, right? But in fact, the vector that's being drawn here is actually this vector. This vector, right? That's that's the result of sub subtracting this vector, subtracting this vector from this vector, right? And it's also equivalent. It's also equivalent to do a vector summation of this vector and this vector flip its direction. Right? If you flip this vector to the opposite direction, right, and then you add it to this vertical vector, right, then that's equivalent to, uh, to, to having a vector here that's pointing to this direction. Right? Then this vector and this vector is connected head to tail and do a summation that's going from this end to this end. Right? That's, and the summation, the, the subtraction is what we call the relative weight, or U, R, E, L. Right. That's the relative speed of the wind with respect to this rotating air void. So those are the velocities that's kind of important on this figure. Now let's look at the, the different angles on this figure. Right. The angle between the relative wind and the rotor plane right, is called the angle of the relative wind and is denoted as phi here. This is the same as, uh, this is similar to our last video. Right? It's identical. Um, so the tangent of phi, the tangent of phi, if we look at this big, big triangle, this big velocity triangle here, right, or, or this triangle, right, that doesn't really matter which one actually. So, so if we look at this big triangle, the tangent of phi actually equals to what? The tangent of phi actually equals to this length dividing this length, right? So this length is what? This length is u1 times 1 subtract a. And this length is what? This length is omega r times 1 plus a prime, right? And if we actually use our definition of the local tip speed ratio lambda r, then omega r divided by u1 is just lambda r, right? So, so tangent phi can be expressed like that. So if we have values for a and a prime, these two induction vectors, so we can actually compute tangent phi, right? We can actually compute tangent phi. So if we are given two induction vectors, then we can compute tangent phi. And from tangent phi, we can actually compute phi, right? So this, this, uh, this angle of relative wind in principle can be computed once we know these two induction vectors. Um, and then the next important angle is the so-called angle of attack, AOA here, angle of attack. And then here we have ARVA, ARVA represents angle of attack, or AOA here, right? This angle is the angle between the relative wind and the chord line of the air void. So, so phi is the angle between the relative wind and the rotor plane, right? And then the angle of attack, or arva, is the angle between the relative wind and the core line of the air foil, right? That's called the angle of attack, arva, right? And this angle equals to phi, this angle, this large angle, subtract the so-called section pitch angle, theta p, this angle here. Right, and theta p is called the section pitch angle. This angle is the angle between the core line of the airfoil and the rotor plane. So that's called the section pitch angle. Right, and why it's called a section pitch angle will become uh, apparent right away. Right, the the because the blade is actually twisted along its span. So the section pitch angle is different at different radius along the blade. So we need a reference pitch angle. And the reference pitch angle is actually the pitch angle at the tip of the blade, which is denoted as beta here. So at the tip of the blade, you have a pitch angle that's beta. Right? And because the blade itself is twisted, right? 
so so at other pl at other radius is different from the the tip then you are going to have a twist angle theta right it's twisted so you have a twist angle theta right? and then the section pitch angle is just uh, the twist angle plus the reference pitch angle which is at the tip theta right so the section pitch angle is just the sort of a, the relative sort of the the, uh, the the pitch angle that's kind of a uh, after the twisting right after the twisting has been accounted for right so 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 that's called the section pitch angle um, so that's the three uh, that's all the angles that we care about right now let's look at the different forces acting on this air void. We actually have two groups of forces. The first group is the lift force DFL and the drag force DFD. So the lift force is actually perpendicular to the relative wind speed. Right, that's the definition of the lift force, right? It has to be perpendicular to the flow direction. And then the direction of the drag force is kind of aligned with the direction of the relative wind. Right. So, 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 so the, lift, the direction of the lift force is actually perpendicular to the direction of the drag force, right? So this is actually a right angle, a 90 degree right angle, right? So this angle, so this angle is actually a 90 degree right angle. Um, so because the lift force is actually perpendicular to the relative wind direction and the drag force is in the same direction as the relative wind, so the angle, so the angle between the drag force and the rotor plane is also phi, right? Because the relative wind and the plane uh, the, the the rotor plane has an angle of phi, right? Because, and a DFD, the drag force is aligned with the relative wind direction. So the angle between DFD and the rotor plane is also phi, right? So this angle must be phi also. Right? So if this angle is phi, then this angle must be phi too. Why is that? Right? Why is that? So what I was telling you is that this angle is a 90 degree right angle, right? So DFL and DFD, the angle between them is a 90 degree right angle, right? And then the angle, the angle between the vertical axis and the, the plane of rotation, the plane of uh, blade rotation, the rotor plane, is also 90 degree. So this is a 90 degree uh, right angle, right? right? So now let's look at the angle that's in the middle, this angle. So, so we know this angle is phi, right? And then this angle plus phi equals 90 degrees, right? And then we know that this angle plus this angle is also 90 degrees because DFL and DFD are uh, perpendicular to each other, right? So, so this angle plus this angle is 90 degrees. And then pl this angle plus phi is also 90 degrees. Then this angle must be phi. Right, this angle must be equal to phi. So this angle is also phi too. Right. Um, the second group of forces is the normal force, or DFN, which is actually perpendicular to the rotor plane. That's the force that's actually pushing the wind turbine back. Right, that's, that's called the normal force. And then we have a tangential force, or DFT. Right, the tangential force is actually creating the torque that makes the blade rotate. Right. So, from the lift and the drag forces, we can actually compute the normal and tangential forces. Right. Because the normal and tangential forces are actually just the components of the just combinations of components of the lift and the drag forces, right? So, so, so these two groups of forces are actually equivalent to each other, right? It's just a different uh, kind of a partition of the same set of forces, basically. 
right? So from the from the lift and the drag forces, we can actually compute the normal and tangential forces. Um, we have a definition of the lift and drag coefficients. The so-called lift and drag coefficients are defined like that. So the numerators, L and D, this big L and big D here, are forces, or lift and drag forces per unit length. So somehow it's actually a, a force density along a line, basically. Right? And then the denominator, the denominator is one half multiplying the density of the air, and then the square of the speed of the air, the right? speed of the wind squared. And then small c is actually the chord length of the air void. That's the core length of the air void, small z. And using this definition, using these two definitions, we can actually represent the lift and drag forces using those coefficients, basically. So the lift and drag forces acting on our airfoil can now be expressed using the lift and drag coefficients. And then the relative wind speed, right? Because the, the u here is actually u r e l, the relative wind speed. C is again the core length of our uh, air volume. Right? Dr is the, the 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 thickness of the ring, right? So so dFl divided by dr is actually the force density along a line, right? right? So 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 by multiplying dr over here, we actually get the force. Right? Here it's actually force force density along a line, right? So 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 multiplying the denominator on this side. What we're we actually getting is actually the force density along a line, right? So, 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 if you divide the dr on both sides, dFl divided by dr, that's sort of the force density along a line. Right. And the lift and drag coefficients are actually functions of the angle of attack arva. So, for different types of air voils. Uh, people have done wind tunnel experiments to measure their lift and drag coefficients uh, at different values of arva, and they have created uh, tables, and we can just uh, read those coefficients from those tables. Right. So once we can actually access those coefficients, we can actually compute the DFL and DFD, the lift and drag forces, if we know what's actually the relative wind velocity. Right. Um, and the relative wind speed. Can actually be computed uh, from the incoming axis, axial wind speed and the angle of fire. Right? We have an expression for for the relative wind speed here, right? That's the relative wind speed. The relative wind speed, the length of this vector is what? The length of this vector, right? It's a because this angle is phi, right? So sine phi actually equals to what? Equals to this this length divided by the length of U R U L, right? So U R E L actually equals to what? Equals to the length of this vector, this side, which is U one times one subtract eight. One subtract times one subtract divided sine phi. Right? So if we know phi, which can be computed by solving this tangential, uh, by computing the tangential phi, right? if we know a and a prime, right? once we know phi, we know sine phi. Once we know sine phi, we can compute U R E L. And all those calculations are based upon the assumption that a and a prime, these two uh, induction vectors, are given to us. Are based on that assumption. That assumption doesn't hold actually. That assumption doesn't hold in practice. And later on, we'll look at uh, how do we actually solve that problem. Right? So, so U R E O in principle can be computed given the induction vectors. Right. Um. So once we have obtained the lift and drag forces, we can compute the normal and tangential forces um, using these two equations. Using these two equations, right? these two expressions actually relates the lift and drag forces to the normal and tangential forces. So the normal force, so the normal force equals to what? Equals to DFL, the lift force. Right? So, so that's the normal force, right? That's the normal force. It equals to what? It equals to the projection of the DFL, the lift force, onto the vertical axis. So DFL times cosine phi is what? 
DFL times cosine phi. That's the projection of DFL onto the vertical axis, right? So if you draw a triangle here, draw a line here, draw 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 a line here that's kind of perpendicular to the to the to the vertical axis, right? And this angle is phi, right? So this DFL times cosine phi exactly equals to the length of this particular right angle triangle that I'm not drawing here. So DFL times cosine phi gives you the projection of DFL onto the vertical axis, right? But that's not enough yet because DFD also has its has a component that's on the vertical axis, right? And then what's actually the projection of DFD onto the vertical axis? Don't forget that this angle is phi, right? This angle is phi. So what we need is actually this. This if we draw a triangle, draw draw a right angle triangle here, right? By by Draw a line here, right? Perpendicular to the vertical axis. Then it's the DFD times sine phi, because this angle will be phi, right? So DFD times sine phi is going to give you the length of this side. Right? So so DFN the normal force equals to DFL times cosine phi plus DFD sine phi. Right? And then DFT, what's actually the tangential force? The tangential force equals to the projection of the lift force onto the horizontal plane, a uh, horizontal uh, uh, rotor plane, right? And in this case, it's DFL times, times sine phi to give you the horizontal projection here, right? And then we have to subtract DFD's projection onto the rotor plane also. DFD's projection onto the rotor plane is actually DFD times cosine phi this time, right? And then because it's pointing in the opposite direction, so you have to subtract it. So there's a subtraction sign here. Minus sign here. Right. So we already have the expressions for the lift and the drag forces in terms of the lift and the drag coefficients and uh, the relative wind speed. We can just bring those expressions for the lift and the drag forces uh, into the expressions uh, for the for the normal and tangential forces. Right? And then obtain the normal and tangential forces expressed in terms of the lift and drag coefficients and also the relative wind speed. Right. So for now we are just examining the cross section on just the one blade at the radius r. Right. If we have B blades, right, could be two, could be three, could be twelve, twenty-four could be any number of blades. B is the number of blades. Right? Then all we need to do is to actually multiply B to the expressions for the normal and the tangential forces. Right? So here we have actually we have actually uh, brought the expressions for the lift and drag forces expressed using those coefficients, lift and drag coefficients, right? and then the relative wind speed into those expressions for normal and uh, tangential forces, and then we have multiplied the B here. Right. The torque, the torque on this uh, ring with radius R actually equals to what? It equals to the tangential force on that ring, multiplying the radius R, multiplying the radius R, because we have B blades, right? So the torque is just uh, multiplying a B. So B times R times the tangential force on that ring. And then we can bring the expression for the tangential force into this uh, expression to get the torque, dQ. Right. Again, the expression for DFT, the tangential force, has been sort of uh, expanded into the relative wind speed and uh, the lift and drag coefficients by using the uh, lift and drag forces by using the expression for lift and drag forces. Right. So by now we have completed our discussion of the so-called blade element theory. At the beginning of this video I was saying that we were going to discuss the so-called blade element momentum method. Right? We haven't discussed the momentum yet. So now let's talk about the momentum. This is a slide that I copied over from the fifth video in which we talked about uh, the actuator disk model for the wind turbine. 
And in that video, we obtained an expression for the thrust force by using the Bernoulli's equation. That's the expression for the thrust force. Right? And it's expressed in terms of the area of the entire rotor disk. U2, the speed of the wind, as seen by the rotor in front of it. The, 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 that's, the, that's the speed of the wind right in front of the rotor. And then U4 is the sort of downwind. Uh, it's in, in far field, in a, in a downwind direction. That's the ambient velocity already. So, 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 so this expression actually involves uh, the cross-sectional area of the entire uh, rotor disk, right? But for now, we are only considering a ring with radius r and thickness dr. So all we need to do is to actually replace this A2, this, uh, this area for the entire rotor disk, with uh, the cross-sectional area of that ring. Um, the cross-sectional area of that ring is actually shown on the first uh, slide of this particular video. That's the expression for the cross-sectional area of this entire ring. Right. 2 pi times r, r is the radius. 2 pi times r, that's the circum circumference of the circle, right? And then dr is sort of the thickness. So, um, Both, both U2 and U4, again, this is the slide is copied over from video 5. Both U2 and U4 can be expressed using U1, which is the uh, uh, free stream wind speed, right? and the axle induction factor A. Right. And uh, so now bring, now bring the expression for the cross-sectional area and the expressions for U2 and U4 into our representation of the thrust, right? Into our representation of the thrust. Here I have replaced T with dt because uh, we are examining the thrust on just a, a ring. It's not on the entire rotor disk, so I re replace it with dt, right? And then, and then, what do we have after some sort of algebraic manipulation and the simplifications? What we have obtained is an expression for dt in terms of the free stream uh, wind speed and the axial induction factor. Right. And this expression is actually obtained from the actuator disk model. And that model only considers the linear momentum in the axial direction. Right. And this is the result from that linear momentum uh, theory. Right. And remember that we still have an expression for the normal force acting on the ring obtained from the blade element theory, right? So in the blade element momentum method, these two forces must be equal to each other. So df dt must be equal to dfn. So dfn must be equal to dt. And this equality, this equality gives us this kind of relation. So dfn equals to this thing, right? This expression here, right? Df, dfn, that's dfn, dfn, that's this expression, and then df uh, dt equals to this thing, right. and considering that the relative wind speed has this particular expression, that's also expressed in terms of the axial induction factor and u1, right? The free stream uh, wind speed. So, so bring these things together we can solve for A, the axial induction vector. And the result is like that. It's actually a quite simple uh, equation if we actually take into account the definition of the coefficient of Cn. Cn equals to the lift coefficient times cosine phi plus the drag coefficient times sine phi. That's Cn. That's, that's, uh, we are just using Cn, this symbol, to represent this kind of longer uh, expression. And now here we have introduced something that's called a solidity, sigma. And sigma is also a function of r, the radius. Right. Uh, the solidity is, uh, well, if we look at the, the expression, it actually equals to the core length times the number of blades divided by 2 pi r. 2 pi r is what? 2 pi r. Uh, so, so, so if you think about it, it's actually the fraction of the area inside of the ring 
that is actually covered by blades, basically. Right. So if we multiply the r on both the numerator and denominator, you're going to see that it's actually the fractional area occupied by uh, the blade. So we got a we got an expression for 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 the axial induction vector. Right? The axial induction vector. Right? We still need an expression for the angular induction vector a prime. We have used the linear momentum method, uh, linear momentum, right? But we have not used the angular momentum yet. So this is a slide that I copied over from the sixth video, in which we obtained an expression for the torque, for torque acting on a on the annual annulus ring with the radius r. That's from the sixth video. The small omega here is actually the angular speed of the rotating wake. And because the angular, angular induction factor is defined as the ratio between the small omega and two times the capital omega, capital omega is the angular speed of the rotating uh, rotor. Uh, so we can replace the small omega in the torque expression. So we can replace this small omega with capital omega and the angular induction factor A prime. Right. That's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm basically just uh, replacing this small omega with, uh, with 2 times A prime times capital omega. Right. Right. And then after some simplifications, we obtain an expression for dq, the torque. And this torque is obtained from just considering the angular momentum. Right? That was uh, from the sixth video. Actually. And remember that we also have an expression for the torque created by the tangential force from the blade element theory that we just obtained. Right. It was like that. Right. And then in the blade element momentum method, these two torques must be equal to each other. So dq equals to dq. And this equality, this equality allows us to solve for a prime, the angular induction vector, which also has an expression that's relatively simple. Right? Again, the solidity sigma here, right? And then CT is just a, a shorthand notation for this longer expression. That's the lift coefficient times sine phi subtract co uh, the, uh, drag coefficient times cosine phi. So by now, we have obtained a complete iterative algorithm for computing the two induction vectors, right? So, so, so these two equations, A and A prime, are based upon being able to actually solve for the lift and drag forces, uh, being able to actually solve for phi, right? Solve for phi. And in order to solve for phi, we also need values for A and A prime, right? In order to solve for phi, we need to know the tangential tangent of phi, right? In order to know the tangent of phi, we need to know a and a prime. So it looks like there is a circular logic here, and that's exactly what that's exactly what this um, iterative algorithm is actually doing. It's trying to actually solve for a and a prime iteratively. So we're going to start with a initial guess, an initial guess value for the two induction vectors. Typically, we're just assuming that a and a prime equals to zero. We're going to start with zero. And then we can adjust the compute the angle of the relative wind using this tangent of phi, right? the expression for the tangent of phi. Once we know the tangent, we know the phi, the angle of phi. Right? And then after we have obtained the angle of phi, we can actually compute the angle of attack by using phi subtract the section pitch angle, theta p. Right? Once we get the once we got the angle of attack. We can take a look at the, the, the exact category of the airfoil that we're actually using for each of the cross sections. And then just to read those uh, lift and drag coefficients from those tables. Right. And then once we have those lift and drag coefficients, we can actually compute a new value for A and A prime, those two induction vectors. Right? Don't forget to Cn and Ct, both of them are expressed using phi the sine and the cosine of phi, and also the lift and drag coefficients, right? So, so, and those lift and drag coefficients 
depends upon our world, right? So, so, so we need our world in order to actually get the correct value for the different drag coefficients. And then we also need the category of the type of the airfoil in order to actually uh, obtain those uh, coefficients, right? Once we have those coefficients, we can compute a CN and a CT, and then we can compute a new value for A and A prime, right? If the induction factors that we just computed changed more than a certain tolerance, then we go back to step two. We go back to the step two. Now we have a new value for A and A prime, the, the two induction factors. Right? We recompute tangent phi, and then recompute phi, and then recompute the angle of attack, reobtain the, the two coefficients, and then recompute A and A prime again. Right. We continue this loop until the the difference between the value that we uh, between between until the difference between the induction the, the difference in the induction factors between two consecutive iterations is below a certain tolerance. Right. So once 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 the iteration has converged, we can actually compute the local loads, the different forces based on the newly computed uh, uh, induction factors right once we got the once we got the uh, forces on one ring right at r we can actually apply exactly the same analysis to different r just different rings right? we are dividing the entire roller disk into many many different rings right and then we can just uh, repeat the entire algorithm for different radius different rings at different radius and eventually we can sum up uh, all the forces on each ring and obtain the Total force on the entire disk, and uh, the entire algorithm is these days called the classic plate element momentum theory. Right. 